Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to our webinar, um, first webinar of a long time that we've put out as a business to promote and share some of our thoughts and insights as to what the world of retail and the world that we're dealing with as a supplier to retail um, is doing and how it's changing. Um, Stephen, who's joining us today, is both a friend and a colleague. I'm working with Stephen currently on the Spring Fair Advisory Board helping make our trade shows better for the future. But um, we also have known each other for quite a long time now, both virtually and in person, um, as we started in webinars together back during COVID, similar to the top one of the topics we're talking about today. And the context of, of Stephen's experience, which I'm sure he'll share with you himself in a minute, is that he really is a leader in our trade in this field. And, and the field that I'm referring to is how to make retail more compelling, how to make the experience and the, the drive of people into especially physical bricks and mortar retail uh, more compelling and more um, profound at a time where driving people back to high streets or to any kind of retail store is harder than ever when there is so much convenient online shopping opportunity. So Stephen's been working in this field for a long time um, and he has so much experience, but we're also both he and I very aligned on what the what the world of retail needs to be what it's going to have to be to survive for the long term. So we're thrilled to have Stephen with us today. Um, one of the key things that we've been sure about as uh, putting on Widup Fest this year and that's going to be rolled out every year from now on, is that we know that as a business, we have a lot of experience and access to a lot of experience that we want our customers to have access to too. And that experience is, is not only relevant to our team in terms of making us better at what we do, um, but more relevant to our customer base so that we're providing more than just a product. We're providing um, our history, our experience, our knowledge and opportunity of what we're seeing in the world of retail. And Widup Fest is one opportunity for us to do a lot more of that. Um, and we're going to be doing a lot more of that going forward. It's a subject very close to my heart on the, on the Giftware Association. Um, and we are working hard both as an association and with people like Stephen to make sure that as an industry, we're all doing better. So thrilled to have Stephen with us here today. He's going to share some of his insights and there'll be so much to take away. So please make notes. We are recording this uh, so you can watch it back and share with all the customers that uh, that you feel fit. So thank you, Stephen, so much for your time. I know you're a busy man, particularly in the start of trade show season, but we appreciate your time and your insight. So over to you. It's a great pleasure. Thank you very much, Stephen, and good morning, everyone. I'm going to share my screen and um, we'll crack straight into it. Okay, so uh, I'm really delighted to be part of Widup Fest. Um, I'll say a little bit more about why I think Widup Fest is such a great um, initiative um, shortly. Um, I'll tell you a bit about who I am as well. I'm going to be talking about the ambience effect coming to your emotional rescue. In fact, coming to your customers and your business's emotional rescue, uh, because this is all about how we tap into and actually uh, trigger the emotions that we need our customers to feel in relation to retail and I 100% I um, endorse everything that Stephen said about the future of retail and the fact we've got to actually fight for it we've got to be um, throwing all of our creativity and our passion into it because that's what has always made retail great the image that you can see there is um, one of my favorite uh, places in the world actually it's um, the El Fen Hotel in Marrakesh in Morocco. Um, it's a, it was actually conceived by Richard Branson's sister, who knew, Vanessa, who um, runs it. And it, it comprises a collection of about 12 riads, uh, sort of houses around courtyards, uh, with a rooftop restaurant, bar, pool, you can just probably imagine overlooking the, uh, the great uh, Jamar El Fanar, the great market square, and just beyond is the the souk and all of the products that you see in the shop which is at, at uh, street level in the hotel 
um, are sourced directly from the souk, from makers, from craftspeople. Um, all of the uh, food is sourced locally. All of the textiles for uniforms, for bed linen, the furniture, everything in the hotel, which is a sort of contemporary take on uh, traditional um, Moroccan culture, but also delivers modern luxury, um, is sourced from the uh, from the old town of Marrakesh. And so it's about authenticity. It's about carrying that through so that the team are all recruited from uh, within, uh, you know, sort of a few hundred yards of, of the hotel. Um, and it means that their prices are affordable. Um, Andy Oliver and Fred Syriax did one of their remarkable places to eat programs, which you may have seen, um, having breakfast at El Fen, and they couldn't believe how cheap it was. And they were told, well, it's because everything comes from just over there. And the team are passionate about it because, you know, it's giving them the opportunity to work in luxury uh, or retail um, or hospitality, um, but also deliver something they can really be proud of and believe in and, and is actually um, authentic to their, their culture and celebrates it. So I could stop there, really. That's kind of the, the subject, but let's keep going. So uh, doing the introduction now, I'm going to talk a little bit about who I am and what I do so that you just know where this is all coming from. I'm going to talk about emotions and ambience. Um, going to talk about how you can model your customer experience, uh, whatever type of business you are, whether you're a retail business, whether you're a supplier to retail, um, this um, is for you. Um, designing the customer emotional journey, because we want to um, not just provoke one emotion, but actually curate uh, the emotional journey. And, and I'll tell you some surprising examples of people who do that. Um, the business case for this, which is terribly important to all of us, especially at the moment. And there's a free gift at the end. So you get a kind of loyalty bonus if you stay to the end. So uh, my business is called Stephen Spencer and Associates. And it's not called that because I'm an egomaniac. It's called that because it's me plus these amazing associates. We help businesses to improve their results by focusing on what it is that they uniquely deliver to their customers, make sure that they're clear about that, make sure they're clear about who their customers are, that will really, really uh, engage with their value proposition and then help them to deliver it throughout the customer journey. And we have people here who've worked like me in organizations doing this with PL responsibility. So we're not theoretical consultants. We're all about helping businesses um, and organizations to thrive by working alongside them. Uh, as Stephen mentioned, one of the things that I'm very excited to be doing is working with Hive and the GA and other trade bodies and um, a group of retailers and suppliers to um, reimagine um, spring and autumn fair um, because uh, just like physical retail, um, in-person trade shows have taken a bit of a hammering over the past few years. And so we're very much thinking about, and particularly next year is the 75th anniversary of Spring Fair, you know, how do we make a compelling case for in-person shows, which I'm sure you'd all agree are vital um, to that creativity, that human connection that makes retail um, so special when it's done well. So um, just briefly to give you a flavor of some of our clients, because um, I, I want to sort of emphasize that uh, what we're talking about is relevant to a wide range of businesses. Um, we work with museums and heritage sites. Um, you may have seen Blenheim Palace, which is top right. Uh, on the news literally today hosting the European uh, Political Leaders Summit. Um, we've been working with them for about five years now on their customer experience, their customer journey, and helping them with their culture um, so that employees come into the, the organisation and quickly understand that the culture they're in is totally focused on the guest 
and the guest experience um, and sharing the amazing heritage and the conservation work and the, the work to um, make Blenheim um, sustainable and maximise its contribution to its community with the million visitors that, that come to Blenheim every year. Uh, top left is the Medieval Museum in Waterford in Ireland. We do a lot of work in Ireland where we help um, Fulcher Ireland, the tourist board, um, work with destinations and attractions to uh, develop a more coherent and compelling offer to bring visitors out beyond Dublin to explore Ireland's wonderful um, uh, countryside and um, uh, heritage attractions and culture and food and music and people um, through a strategic approach. So actually saying what is going to bring people here why would they stay longer? Um, what are they going to get out of it? What must we deliver? So working with um, a whole range of businesses and, and stakeholders there. Bottom left may surprise you. Um, I work with a laundry business, a family owned laundry business, which specializes in being uh, the only uh, non wired bra specialist in the UK which means um, that we've been able to develop a value proposition for them that um, they're there for all of life stages. And this is a business that had been really hammered by COVID, by um, uh, supply chain issues, obviously by cost of living, by the word I'm not going to use today, but the B word, which I'm, I'm sure you can uh, fill in the blanks. Um, and we've helped them to both um, rediscover and, and re-energize their, their brand proposition, refocus on um, those uh, mainstream retailers that um, are still around that um, they they need to sort of present a, a new and fresh proposition to, but also the independent retailers where they can really be the experts and, and trusted partners. And um, also their B2C business, which um, they had to start during COVID, and now are really embracing and it's actually turning into a really significant contributor. Um, I, I won't go through all of the clients, but just one more, just to go from one extreme to the other is um, uh, the one with the plane in the middle of it. This is um, uh, an experience based on the Discovery Channel. It's a Warner Brothers um, brand and we're working with the Saudi government to roll out 21 um, visitor attractions based on multiple brands and multiple um, experiences. And uh, so each of the, ex the attractions has multiple retail formats and we're, we're actually um, and have been for some time developing the whole retail strategy for them. And it's very exciting um, part of the world. There's a lot of very positive change going on there and um, they're working with experts from all around the world because they're spending, you know, hundreds of millions, um, if not well over a trillion dollars on, um, on, on diversifying the economy and focusing more on um, family and, and um, uh, visitor entertainment. Anyway, so that's some of the different things that we get involved with. So we call ourselves architects of ambience and I will explain what ambience is all about but what we do is we come in and perhaps work alongside architects or work alongside shop fitters or work alongside designers um, be it in retail be it in hospitality be it in um, culture to um, to say right how is this going to work this great vision that that you have this great brand promise that you have in practice operationally commercially and and how is it going to be sustainable um, and so we do that based on our experience of doing that um, in organisations and now for the last 10 years with clients. So what does all this look like? Here's an example um, that's going on as we speak. Harrods is celebrating 175 years of trading this year. And how are they celebrating? Um, they're doing it by working collaboratively with the many, many brands that they they work with. Um, they're also aiming to say something about the future of Harrods as well as its heritage. Um, this is Harrods facade covered in giant colourful spots for a Louis Vuitton 
activation. They've been working with artists. They've been working uh, right the way across the store on activations, really to create joy for the customer, but obviously to showcase their brands and, and to, to show a fresh face of Harrods, taking something that, that is theirs, their 175th anniversary, and turning it into a commercial opportunity. And we are part of Widup Fest. And as someone who, as a retail buyer for more than 20 years, I used to groan when I was invited to, um, I won't say who, but a number of previews, getting on the train, going to some Midlands or Northern part of the world, or it could be Southwestern or Southeastern. Let's, let's be kind of egalitarian about this and going into a showroom and being given some curly sandwiches and you know a bowl of crisps and shown all these products and really just thinking that wasn't that wasn't worth the time out of the office that wasn't worth the time and trouble of getting there with fest i think is an amazing way of just taking that um that product launch uh uh mechanic and turning it into something much more exciting um here we are so we have a month-long festival showcasing 700 brand new products and then not just that you've got um you know if, for people like me in the past uh, free travel accommodation and gourmet lunch sounds a lot better than the curly sandwiches special guest speakers and seminars this is this is what we're doing right now show only promotions 20 percent discount twenty thousand square feet of luxurious showrooms uh now or never bespoke product design studio some of this i'm reading out i don't even know what it means but i want to be there and i'm actually sorry that i'm not there today but uh i think widup fest is a great example of taking something that you have to do in your business and making it exciting and making it focused on the customer so that they will have fun too and i, I really uh, congratulate Stephen and his team for doing that. However, what does this look like on a budget? Um, because all of our budgets are squeezed at the moment. And um, I'm passionate, as Stephen is, about uh, the future of physical retail. And I think a lot of it comes from um, independent shops, startups. Um, you know, who is going to be the next Oliver Bonus or the next body shop? They've, they've got to start somewhere. And if they have no budget at all, they can still do something um, if they've got a concept and they, they've got a, a passion uh, about it. So this was a client, the National Civil War Center in Newark, which was a reinvention of the Newark um, Local Authority Museum. They discovered that they had enough uh, content, uh, objects, uh, material, um, celebrating um, or, or commemorating the English Civil Wars, that they um, could justifiably um, reposition themselves as the National Civil War Centre. And so there was a lot of investment went into creating that and they had quite a small shop um, and they'd invested heavily in stock, reflecting both the Puritan and the Royalist um, sides. And uh, as Christmas was approaching, I said to them, well, what are you going to do for Christmas? They said, well, we, we can't really do anything. We've got no money left and we haven't really got any space. I mean, what you see there in the picture is almost the whole shop. So we said, well, we, you, we've got to do something. You, you know, Christmas is, as we all know, our biggest retail opportunity of the year. Um, so in, in simple terms, we devised a Christmas campaign based on the strap line, which side will you choose? So they were inviting people to come and learn about the civil wars and then decide which side they, they inherently sympathised with. We had room for one tree. So one tree was divided down the middle with Puritan gifts on one side and Royalist gifts on the other. It broadly fell that the Puritan gifts were more gifts for men and the Royalist gifts were, were more gifts for women, but not exclusively. We carried that theme and point of sale throughout the shop. So, you know, products that had been bought for the museum audience um, were simply re rebadged uh, with point of sale, you know, perfect stopping, stocking filler, um, Puritan or, or Royalist. 
and um, they had a great Christmas. And not only that, but they also started um, uh, an Instagram trend in Newark um, with competition to have the best Christmas tree. So other traders and other um, other attractions got involved as well. And it turned into something that continued um, certainly for, for uh, two or three years um, after that. So, um, you know, it shows that your your only limit is your imagination, not your budget. So I wonder how you're feeling right now. Uh, you might be feeling slightly bemused. Um, you might be, who knows, some of you might actually be looking at your emails while you're notionally signed into this webinar. I certainly hope not, uh, but you might be. Or you might be feeling a bit stressed. You might be feeling combination of stressed and excited I, I i think this is great i want to do something with this but you know i've got so many other things to do i've got so many emails coming in um the reason i'm asking is because um how you're feeling and you are my customers for the duration of this webinar uh is really important to me because how you're feeling will have a direct impact on how engaged you are with the topic uh, if i was trying to sell you my services which i'm not how engaged you you would be and how open to that you would be now some of you may be old enough to know that uh, the reference to emotional rescue is a reference to a rolling stones album and song and this is about emotional rescue for your business because when somebody's in a positive mood they'll buy more more often and then they'll get a dopamine release to encourage more of this how much more Analysis shows customers who had the best past experiences spent 140% more compared to those who had the poorest past experience. Now, I know you'll probably be thinking, well, of course, you know, we all know happy customers, you know, is what, what we're striving for. But I've been increasingly getting uh, interested in why that is, the science of it the neuroscience of it, how your brain works and how it perceives and processes experiences and potentially turns um, those into uh, buying decisions. Um, Mike Lever is a, a sales trainer I, I met recently at a conference. He's a neuroeconomist. He looks at how people's emotions trigger their buying behaviors. And uh, he very kindly gave me this quote. Now, before we go any further, let's just reflect this. Uh, although it's dated 2023, this review came out this week, yesterday, I think, from the High Streets Task Force. Um, if you're not engaged with the High Streets, ta High Streets Task Force, it's worth doing so because um, there's lots and lots of great intelligence and data and, and they have regular webinars. Um, you know, there's many, many initiatives around the High Street and I'm not sure which one's going to be the most successful but I try and take an interest in as many of them as I can. You can download this from highstreetstaskforce.org and the four highlights that they identified were that footfall is up um, 2023 versus 2022, but still down 9% on expected levels post COVID, i.e. since 2019. We probably know this. The patterns of peak days and months for high street visits haven't changed post COVID. The evening economy increase of 2%, that is, it varies obviously across the country, it means footfall at 7 p.m. now matches 9 a.m., which is an interesting shift if you, if you weren't aware of it and if you shut your shop at 6 p.m., for example, uh, or if you open at, at uh, 10 a.m. Uh, and it says here 2023 may signal the end of retail as high street's dominant function. Now, I was at a conference last week called Main Street, uh, sorry, Experience on Main Street, which is another play on uh, a Rolling Stones album. So I'm very much in my comfort zone there. And it was all about the role that retail and other forms of regeneration play in building or strengthening communities. It was held at King's Cross, which is a fantastic example. I'm sure you're aware of Cold Drops Yard, but the uh, University of the Arts London, um, Central St. Martins was, was the, the venue. And the sort of feeling of creativity and, and um, people just hanging out 
there because because it's a great place to hang out was palpable and they were talking about the part that creating experiences for people you know which means finding out what they want and helping to give it to them plays in regeneration and i'm sure we all want to see our high streets regenerated um one of the examples they gave was that there's now a monthly chess tournament 200 people come along they they take up uh, tables and chairs um outside um uh, some of the the cafes and nobody organized that from the developers angle that that was self-started by somebody from the community who thought this would be a really cool place to have our um, monthly chess gathering and and now it's a huge success and they were saying that more and more of the um, events and activities that take place are organized by the community that they have nurtured back into an area that used to be very 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 downtrodden and, and quite dangerous um more um stats um this again was a very recent um survey by gallup into how customer expectations have changed and um not surprisingly they're expecting more for their money because um obviously they're more conscious of the money that they're they're spending more money more cost means i want higher levels of service not necessarily getting it but that's what we want greater expectations for virtual and remote service too so even though a lot of what i'm talking about today is going to sound like it's um focusing on physical uh, experiences it you know it's really really important that having designed your concept and your experience as i will show you how to to think about that you uh, apply that into your digital experience and that the digital experience doesn't end up just being you know a different experience not necessarily um reflecting your brand or not necessarily consistent with the physical experience but customers are definitely surprise surprise I feel as if I've been saying this for the past 30 years getting more demanding so I've alluded several times to ambience so what is it I had a bit of an epiphany um a few years ago, I was at a trends presentation and this uh, report was shared to study into um, how people experience brand activations. And it suggested customers remembered 1% of what they touched, 2% of what they heard, 5% of what they saw, 15% of what they tasted and 35% of what they smelt. Now, there's a lot more to this than, than just these stats. For example, um, there is, uh, evidence very compelling evidence that people are potentially six times more likely to buy a product if they pick it up so if you're a shop or you're a supplier and you have a trade stand get people to pick up your products uh, as quickly as possible because they're much more likely to buy it if they do but equally i was very excited by this idea about smell being 35 percent smell triggers emotions it triggers memory which in turn triggers emotions by the way emotions are not a thing they don't live in any particular part of the body if you if you think about it you know your emotions can be a combination of the thoughts going through your mind how you feel in your gut uh, whether you've got lots of energy or you feel lethargic and so on and and it's really about what the brain is doing what it's processing that triggers those emotions that I want to focus on um, for a little bit of this uh, this webinar. So I noticed that if you add those percentages together, um, it only adds up to 58%. So this is what I call the COD science bit because it isn't science, it's my, my made up theory um, that there's a sixth sense and that sixth sense is the feeling the emotion customers get when the whole experience delivers the brand promise so if you can think about how to use all of the senses rather than just one or two of them um, then you will end up creating an experience that um, customers can relax into 
and uh, as I'll show you that's very important because relaxation triggers a uh, higher value perception um, so you know you know yourself if you walk into a restaurant and you can tell that it's being properly run and everything is as it should be you go to the toilets and the toilets you know have a, a smell that reflects the overall experience um, not the drains um, you know the service is seamless the music is right you know it's all been thought about that's when customers get that feeling which I call the sixth sense and I think you know, we all need to develop a sixth sense as well and walk into our business every day and say, are we doing that? So ambience architecture, um, this is just a, a small insight into how we do it. So we were invited to create um, a networking lounge for the Museums and Heritage Show, which is the largest gathering of museum and heritage, historic house, gallery, um, castle, um, professionals in uh, the UK and it's held at Olympia in May and we were invited to create the networking lounge and so we called it the ambience networking lounge and we thought about how we could bring all of the senses into play and so some of the kind of design concept uh, shown here and then this is what it turned into and the image in the middle is when is before we opened the other images show it was pretty much rammed for the whole two days um everyone loved it um we were able to use some products that you may be aware of for example the candles were uh, supplied by find your glow um that was uh, to obviously reflect um smell and by a miracle we were allowed to light them as well um we also had spices from the spice kitchen very generously um, donated so that we could both um, showcase taste but also people could go away with um, a, a pack of spice as well and we had audio was represented by um, an audio guide supplier to visitor attractions um, that was focused on what if people don't want to be bombarded with you know visual and um being in in the attraction and then then we've got we're talking to them as well how about if we just use sound to set the scene maybe sound effects or or uh music that just complements the scene anyway i could go on we created an environment where people felt comfortable networking and uh this is the second year we've done it um and we may well be doing it at a trade show near you in the foreseeable future. So watch this space. Now, we think it's really important that you don't just have a great concept uh, because actually that concept is only going to work if you've built it properly, like any um, house or ent entity, enterprise. So um, we've created this model. Um, I was very lucky. I went to the Disney Institute a um, long time ago now to learn how they do it, how they manage great customer experiences. You know, how do you get 77,000 employees at Walt Disney World to uh, apparently all deliver spontaneous magical moments um, re reactively as well as proactively? Well, you don't have really complicated systems for that, but you do have a model and so this is our version. We think it's better than the Disney model because um, because it has an acronym, which is STARS. Theirs doesn't. Um, anyway, so uh, the first S is for story. This is your value proposition. This is what it is that you both believe in your mission and what you believe your customers value, the value proposition. Call it an elevator pitch, call it a brand story, call it what you will. But we work with clients to help them to get real clarity around that. T is for team. I can't, cannot believe how uh, under uh, invested I find teams generally are when it comes to actual quality time being dedicated to developing and nurturing a team that will own your story and go out and deliver it with confidence in every interaction we could do a whole separate webinar on that but believe me you know your team whoever they are and they, they may be they may be a partly an outsourced team 
uh, you know, anything from third parties who, who manage your fulfillment to um, if you employ a, a additional people or even bring back of house people onto your trade stand, unless they own and, and have the confidence to communicate um, and share your story, um, you know, you're, you're kind of wasting money. Ambience we've touched on, it's the story as you've designed it as, as to be experienced by your customers. So the whole environment, whether physical and digital or one or the other, um, how you've created that customer journey. And, and I'll show you how to think about that. Recipients, the people on the receiving end of the experience, your customers, how well do you know them? How well do you really know them and what they're now looking for? Uh, you know, do you do you keep up on on sort of um, the sources of data that I've alluded to? Um, do you talk regularly to your customers informally, not just through surveys or not just through uh, not just ad, ad hoc, but um, in, in a sort of concerted way to really understand how they they might be changing? The laundry manufacturer I, I was talking about earlier had a uh, one of their customer personas was their sort of 70 plus customer um, who is actually their bread and butter and has probably been a very loyal customer and their persona was called Doris and she had kind of a bad hair style and she was a bit frumpy and I said my mother-in-law is uh, 75 she is very active she actually has had breast cancer and and um uh, and so the the post-surgery bra that uh my client does specialize in is 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 uh she's a customer for that um she is very stylish very trendy she would be totally offended if uh, she was represented by doris so you know as a result of that conversation they they updated their personas to reflect how their customers were changing and then last and by no means least the second s is for systems how well are you organized to ensure consistent delivery so you need systems for all of these things you know for constantly updating and communicating your story for constantly uh recruiting inducting motivating supporting training your your team uh for continuously um uh, evolving and maintaining your um, setting, your the, the, the place uh, or um, environment in which your experience is delivered and for knowing about your customers um, and, and making it easy for them to do business with you. So systems underpin all of this. And again, some of what I'll share is, uh, is about that. Now, the emotional journey, and we go back to the Rolling Stones for a moment, um, this is a set list of a concert I was at at um, Anfield in 2022. Um, as an aside, Keith Richards um, produces a an art uh, um, treatment of the set list for every single show the Rolling Stones do, and um, and then it's sold as an art print uh, as a limited edition, which I think is very clever, and I I have this uh, at home. Uh, but the point about it is that set lists are uh, a very good metaphor for the emotional journey that your customer will go on and that's because if you imagine you go to a concert and you know you go to see one of your favorite artists they don't just come out and do all of their top hits straight off the bat do they they probably come out and do quite a big hit maybe another one then they'll do a couple of um uh, less well known maybe they'll do that bit where they say we're going to do our uh, few songs from our, um, our, our our new album and everyone kind of relaxes a bit and then then we come back into maybe a, a couple of up tempo numbers getting building up um, the, the the kind of uh, excitement in the room and then maybe a pause again and then up to our um, climax of of our um, of of our finale and then uh, pause again and then out they come and do the um uh the the encore and the reason for this is because they know that no one can be at peak excitement peak emotion 
for two hours. And in fact, Mick Jagger, I, I learned this just the other day, they're touring in America at the moment, and Mick Jagger actually wants to know for each city they go to, what can you tell me about the audience? Because he wants to tweak the set list to reflect um, what he thinks will be the best experience for the audience. So this is an approach that I think you can apply to your customer journey. By the way, I'm going to commend um, a, a, an author and a book to you. Um, Kevin Irvin Kelly, who's an architect and works with many brands, says this, on any given day, we experience a wide range of environments that produce different types of sensations, feelings, emotions, and perceptions within us. We're processing all the time, you know, temperature, uh, the environment in the room, um, you know, how we're feeling, uh, what's familiar to us, what's unfamiliar to us. And our, our, what basically what our brain is doing is processing out um, anything that is either, as it says here, um, annoying to us um, or potentially dangerous to us. It, it will focus on because, you know, its first duty is to protect us, but also um, it will identify anything that is arousing, is exciting, is attractive to us. And that's how the brain works. I'll give you an example of that. So I definitely think you should read this book. I absolutely loved it. Um, this is the book in our Ambience Networking Lounge. And it's about, do we still need physical places like grocery stores, restaurants, office buildings? Or will the replacement economy led by the tech titans and retail giants wipe out these venues in their rapid ascent to unicorn status? Well, Kevin Kelly is all about what he calls convening, creating places that people want to go to. And I think your shop, your showroom should be a place like that. That's why I think what uh, Widdop Fest stands for is so exciting. So please read that book. He also talks about, and this is how I can describe, you know, what goes on in the brain. Supermarket are laid out like warehouses had you noticed that and the reason for that is because when they first came in and we had this explosion of choice it was far easier to lay them out like that and it hasn't changed as he says but customers don't want to have to work that hard you know I don't know about you I don't have eyes in the side of my head so when I walk down a supermarket aisle I can't possibly take in all those thousands of products what I actually do is I focus on finding the things I came in for and try and get out as quickly as possible. Now, yeah, I might be tempted by some confectionery at the checkout or, you know, the displays at the front of the store, seasonal product, that sort of thing. But generally speaking, we go into a supermarket on a mission and the mission is get in, get what we came for, get out as quickly as possible. And it's generally a draining experience because our brain's having to work very hard to filter everything else out. Your brain uses between 20 and 50 percent of your energy. So that's why you get you can get very tired, you know, from just like being in a webinar, being um, being in an environment where actually you're not doing anything physically, but you're concentrating or, or using your brain um, and, and it's using lots of energy. So we're looking for experiences that um, that leave our customers energized and, and um, refreshed and, and feeling positive, not drained like a supermarket. He makes the point, you know, we we started to interact probably in caves around a, around a fire. And then that became, you know, the, the drawing room or the living room or the dining room table or the kitchen table supermarkets could uh, have a different business model you know whereby you could buy all the necessary stuff online absolutely definitely if you could guarantee they wouldn't make substitutions and it would come to you when it was convenient and you didn't have to sort of literally unload everything one product at a time which i hate but then you could go to the store for inspiration. And if the, if the departments were laid out more like rooms, you know, like a, a cheese room or a, a butchery, you know, almost shops within shops. And you could go in and actually discover new products, new utensils, new techniques, new cultures, new flavors, 
um, it would be a totally different experience and perhaps reflect where a more sustainable model um, of food production and retailing might go. But there's lessons for all of us, I think, in this. So this is your map or a sort of format for your map of your customer journey. Mapping the customer journey is one of the most important things that you can do because your customers are people and they have brains that do all the things I've just been talking about that end up triggering the emotions that either will or won't lead to a sale. So you need to understand what they've been going through to get to you to then go through your experience and then what happens on the other side. Now, this happens to be this could be a, um, a, a visitor attraction. It could be um, a town centre. It could be a destination. Um, take from it what is relevant to you. But um, in that customer journey, you need to start by thinking about where have they come from. You need to think about what's their first impression going to be. First impressions are really important. They kind of create that either sense of confidence that I made the right decision coming here or potentially that slight anxiety or, or you know, potentially I made the wrong decision. Um, then you need to think about what the peak experience is going to be. There's another book. Um, I just happen to have it here. Daniel Kahneman, who wrote Thinking Fast and Slow, and I'm sure some of you will have read it or heard of it. And he popularized um, human behavioural psychology and he and Barbara Fredrickson came up with the um, peak end rule and the peak end rule says that the way people actually perceive their experience and will remember it and therefore will review it and also regard you is based on the peak experience that they had and the end experience. So thinking about what is the peak experience of coming into my shop or coming onto my trade stand or coming to my showroom you know, is it, I remember going to uh, Atlanta and meeting a, 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 a friend and, and a supplier who worked for Halcyon Days Enamels. And uh, uh, there he was with, with his stand and, and after the niceties, he said, let's enjoy the product. And he looked so proud. He used such inclusive body language. He treated each product as if it was worth a million dollars because it he emphasized the quality, the craftsmanship, um, the uniqueness of each product and how it could fit into um, our uh, our range and, and be, be matched to our customer. Now, there are also things in the customer journey that um, aren't so great, the necessary evils. It might be how they travel to you. It might be finding you or navigating your website. Um, and these are opportunities to enhance. So, you know, for example, Kevin, uh, sorry, Mike Lever, who I mentioned earlier, worked with a hairdresser whose customers all arrived stressed because the, there was no car park near the hairdresser and they either had to be on a meter or they had to park on the other side of town but they had a staff car park. And by negotiating with the staff and giving them uh, vouchers to park in the um, town car park, they managed to uh, swap over the staff car park to be the customer car park, result happier customers, staying longer, having all the bells and whistles, becoming more loyal, giving a bigger tip and, and all the rest of it. Um, then there's what I call the chill, refresh and recharge opportunities. So how do people actually get to, you know, come down a little bit from that peak experience um, when they arrive? You know, how do you give them a sort of reassurance that they've come to the right place? Um, if it's a physical experience, you know, if, if they've been traveling, they might need toilets. They might need coffee. You may or may not provide that, but you could think about maybe even telling them where they could get those things before they uh, come to you if if that um is, is a better option or a, a more suitable option. Uh, we work with um, a visitor attraction that is on the M25 and they said all our customers arrive really peed off because they've been stuck on the M25. And we said, well, what could you do first of all to make them aware of that? So if they book online, you can 
send them messages, text messages, or um, pref probably preferable, preferable to email, but you can alert them to what the traffic's gonna be like today to allow more time. You could even send them a, a, a live link. Um, when they arrive, you could have, you know, a friendly parking attendant who helps them to get parked and then says like toilets here, coffee here, knowing that they've probably been stuck in their car for longer than they anticipated. So, you know, it's thinking about those things. I was talking at the Giftware Association about this um, earlier in the week, and uh, one of the people there makes a stationary product and he, he only sells it B2B and he sends it in a box. And literally he has hundreds of customers in America and he just found them by Googling bookshops and stationary shops and approaching them. And, and he's never visited them, he doesn't know them. And he said, my box is really important because it, what's in that box, how I could make that box um, contain a surprise, uh, how I could email my customer um, or update them on the progress of the product and what they might do with it. And then when they've got it, what else they might uh, put alongside it is all about adding value. And then finally, um, the end experience. So the peak end rule, remember the end experience is really important. Do you give your customers a virtual or physical thank you, uh, a hug, um, top tip for what to do next, um, reason to come back, reason to feel appreciated, uh, really important. And then of course, if they come back, that's another peak experience for you. So thinking, literally starting by just mapping your customer journey, experience HQ in this, this model, it could be your shop, it could be your showroom, it could be your trade stand, it could be your website but just working out the journey that people go on to you, through you, and out the other side um, is so powerful. And then identifying, you know, what's the first impression, what's the peak experience. It might have more than one peak experience, by the way, depending on how long the experience is. Um, and then uh, what's the end experience. And then of course, we hope they go away talking, thinking, sharing positively about us and, um, uh, likely to return. So um, I'm going to just highlight a couple of things. Uh, you can draw your customer journey map on the back of an envelope, back of a fag pack, it doesn't matter. Great, ex great exercise to do with your team, by the way, because they probably know more about this than you do, uh, arguably, and also they'll own it if you co-create it. So before you go too far down the road, you've identified the key uh, touch points, the key steps in the journey. Focus on what is the end emotion? What's the end experience? And how do we want people to go away feeling when they've done business with this? Then go back to the entry point. What is the first impression we need to create? Do we have our story such that we can deliver it straight off the bat if somebody asks us, what do you do or what's important about this? Or how do we create a great first impression? Um, and then just before that, go back to who is shaping your visitor or customer's perception of your attraction, your shop, your showroom. Um, in other words, you know, have they had a rubbish journey? Are they feeling stressed because, um, you know, they're having a bad day? What is the emotion that we might need to work with to improve um, as they come into our experience? We have to take responsibility for that as the attraction on the M25 we're trying to do. So just a few principles around this for the time uh, for the sorry, the necessary evils, the drains on your brain and your energy, the things that bring your customer down. Uh, Will Guadara, another book I'm going to recommend by him. Um, stay in your own hotel, shop in your own shop. There was a great story about um, Jeff Bezos in a meeting being told that the average call time, uh, or call answer time at their customer services, this must have been a long time ago. I don't suppose you can even phone them now. But anyway, was um, three minutes or under. 
and yet they were getting a lot of complaints. And he said, well, I always go with the anecdotal rather than the data. If the data is telling me something different to the anecdotal, customers are complaining, what um, is the reality? So he said in a board meeting, let's phone. And they phoned customer services. And I think he said uh, 45 minutes and they were still waiting. So experience your own uh, experience if you possibly can. Um, Will Guadara talks about, um, you know, how the soap and the toiletries are always on the side and you get in the shower. Why aren't they there? And then there's not often a shelf you can put them on and all that type of stuff. Will Guadara took 11 Madison Park to be the number one restaurant in the world in the top 50 restaurant awards. And this book, which uh, is partly an inspiration for The Bear, if you've watched that very um, popular TV series and features in season two, is a compelling read about how you create a concept for your brand and then how you work through every detail of how it's going to be delivered until you're as good as you can be. For the chill uh, relaxation um, parts of your experience, don't underestimate how important they are. Researchers at Columbia Business School, this is a famous study, revealed that consumers value products on average 10% more than when, when in a relaxing environment. So, you know, if Stephen's making you feel nice and relaxed in the showroom at, at Widdop because there's a gourmet lunch, not curly sandwiches, you're going to think his products are worth 10% more than you would otherwise have done. So it's really important to give your customers that chance just to chill out and hopefully stay longer in your experience. And then the peak experience, what could that be? I always compare it to seeing the crown jewels at the Tower of London. It's what they came for. But what more can you do? I bought a mini. By the way, I'm conscious that we're nearly out of time and, and I'm just saying that so that uh, hopefully you all remain relaxed and stay with me to the end. I bought a mini. Minis only take, I now know, 57 minutes to assemble in the mini plant here in Oxford. However, they send you videos because every mini is built to order over the couple of months that you're waiting for your mini, showing you apparently your mini being built. So they keep you thinking about it, anticipating it, reassured that it is coming. When you go and get it from the dealership, they have a room that's just a bit bigger than a mini and it's dark. And then they turn on theatrical lighting. And there is your mini in this room looking like the best decision you ever made. And that's what I mean about peak experiences. They could have just said, here's your car. It's outside. Here's the keys. Enjoy it. Would have still been exciting, but they made that a peak experience through uh, just thinking through how they wanted people to feel when they actually first got their hands on their, their new car. So design your customer experience. Don't forget the STARS model, because once you've designed it, um, you need to maintain it. So think about those elements of team, ambience and recipients and what systems you specifically have to underpin the consistent delivery of your story and your brand experience. Some of you may be kind of saying this is going to be expensive. You're spending all this money already is my answer to that. And we know it's gone up hugely in the last couple of years on team, on stock, on utilities, on marketing, on rent and rates. You know all the things you're spending money on. If, for example, your team is not motivated to really engage and excite your customers, if the first impressions on arriving at your premises, there's weeds growing outside. If um, you don't um, have, if, for example, you have toilets and they, they're smelly, if you, know, if you haven't thought through all of those stages, if your website is a bit confusing, you know, all of these things are actually wasting money that you're, you are spending. So this is about maximizing, I don't call it ROI, I call it return on excellent experiences, R-O-E-E, -E, because I hope I've demonstrated that you will get a return on uh, this approach. In case you'd like to know more, we've created an ambience playbook, a how-to guide, which takes you through step-by-step -step how to do this. There's also some additional templates and tools that you can access um, via the playbook. 
if you're exhibiting at Spring or Autumn Fair, I can reveal that you'll be receiving a special um, Spring and Autumn Fair exhibitors version of the playbook with some case studies in there as well. So, so uh, watch out for that. But by all means, come to our website and you can download the playbook. It's free. We won't chase you. And if you want to achieve any of these benefits, um, and who doesn't, then the playbook is there for you. And that is it. Thank you very much. I hope that's been useful. I hope that sparked some interesting thoughts. I hope you feel it's been worth your time. And it's been an absolute pleasure being part of WIDIPFest. Um, if there are any questions, um, Sophia will tell me now, or you're very welcome to ask them. Um, so thank you, and I'll come off sharing now. Um, there's no questions in the chat at the moment, Stephen. I don't know if anyone's got any questions on the call. Um... Well, I hope I answered all the questions. Yeah. <laughs> But if you do have if you do have questions, please reach out. Um, always happy to answer them. Thank you. And uh, and as I say, the playbook might answer some of the questions you will have thinking about this, or or even spark new ones. Um, we're always happy to help. I'm I'm even happier with people saying nice things. So thank you for that. Somebody's already downloaded the playbook. Awesome. That's all I. All I could ask for, it's all I could want, other than being part of Widdup Fest. Thanks so much, Stephen. We really appreciate your time and uh, we hope to have you back in person next time. That would be I'd great. I'd love to. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you very much. See you later. Bye.